Hi there. I'm Ned Ned Nerb the Schizophrenic. Uh, eco-motive should be the only word I make up this video. I don't want to barrage you with word salad and confusion, but what is the Earth? I mean, I'm a person, right? Well, I heard that the lawyers came up with, like, a long time ago that a corporation is legally entitled to the rights of a person. Hmm. I'm going to generalize and extend this to the Earth. I'm going to deem the Earth to be a person. Earth is a being. Earth is a being of life. This is a more adequate definition to me than a hunk of rock we can mine dirt from and splatter all over the place. <laughs> That's a bit weird. That's a bit weird to do such things with Earth. Does Earth have its own use for humans? Free for all? Hmm. Okay, so I mentioned that word eco-motive. Moat, it's related etymologically to motor, motivation, like motor, or I want to do something, right? And uh, we've got another branch of our nervous system called the sensory. It takes things in like sounds. I don't know if the microphone heard it, but I could hear a vroom just as I was thinking of talking. I was overwhelmed with a sensory. The sensory blocked the motor. <laughs> That's kind of how sensory motor conflict can happen. Trying to get around, right? <laughs> so there we have the sensory on the one side and the motor on the other side, where the sensory is like the deep ecology, the understanding of what the earth is for and what humans are for, not just the idea that the earth is for the humans. Mm, but a question, what is anything for? What are things for? That's more like a deep ecological inquiry. So then you've got the motor on the other side where you have the eco-motive scope of actions. What is our behavior and creativity, construction, reshaping of the surface of the planet and the composition of the sky, the atmosphere, even the contents of outer space? <laughs> Those would be under the purview of the eco-motive scope of actions. What humans can do to the earth, not just where we are and where we can grab stuff. Like an environment that's just a place that stays that way and we get to do whatever else. Hmm. Is it like that on earth? And there we go to the Gaia hypothesis, or Gaia theory. Maturana and Varela came up with ideas of Gaian ecological dynamics, which is a big topic, very interesting. Uh, another approach I saw when I was reading a long time ago was the idea that like life makes life, life makes life, life makes life. And uh, so little cellular components like the atmosphere to be a certain composition because then they both flourish. The composition of the atmosphere stays comfortable for the cellular organelle operations to occur. It's pretty basic, pretty, pretty basic chemistry. 
if you want to survive when snowball earth could occur or absolute scorched earth could occur, you'd want the composition of things to stay in a nice, comfortable temperature. So we know that the snowball earth scenario has almost struck a few times where light would just be reflected off the surface of the earth and no longer heat things up. And we also know that the solar output of the sun has continually, on average, increased for billions of years. So unless we discount that the Earth is older than 5,000 years old, um, it looks like the solar output has been increasing for 5 billion years. And therefore, the fact, not the theory, but the fact, fact that 3.8 billion years after life kind of happened here on Earth, we are kind of still comfortable, though climate change and the risks of climate change, I can hear a fire truck. Yeah. Climate change is a ongoing threat. So what makes humanity so special in this Gaian theory, the ecological dynamics? It's our scale of access. Do you hear that fire truck? What cannot build a fire truck? What could a fire truck be used for? It's not just by luck or random fancy that we do things to protect one another, our ecosystems, and the beings around us. It's not just a random affair that we consist with one another until we can, you know, grab something and steal something and just forget about it, free for all. So. That would be where I'm talking the sensory, the deep ecology, you know, understand, really understand and picture cognitively what we have to do as a species. And what we're understanding is that ecomotive scope that we have a use for the earth, not just inherently to ourselves, which is a deep ecological principle related thing where it's like the life forms around us don't just have value to humans they have value in themselves well this is another thing that individual human beings don't realize maybe that our only interest isn't in achieving those goals and aims and object acquisitions that we deem as just wanted by ourselves. We have a value in our group collectivity to maintain the Gaian ecological dynamics that actually support our evolution, that actually support, comfort in the composition of the atmosphere and crust of the earth. Therefore, we have a true commandment for peace for all cultures. There will be no war without resistance from humanity. No point, no value, no honor, just ugliness in anger. We must lift up the weak and needy. We must put down anger, pride, and envy. We should understand and fulfill 
the purpose constrained by our access. It's not a free for all. We are in the world together. We do off gas and intake the output of many streams. Hmm. Yeah, I think the only word I made up was eco-motive. <laughs> That's remarkable. Thanks for listening. I'm Ned Nedner, the schizophrenic, the epileptic, the academic, <laughs> deep ecologist. Please share the video if you learned something. Education.